officially declaring a national emergency. At this point, the United States is now more than two years into two weeks to slow the spread. State by state, residents now being ordered to stay indoors. And for the next 15 days, we can flatten the curve. Flattening the curve and social distancing. Welcome to day 367 of 15 days to slow the spread. Life has never been the same since those fateful days in March of 2020, when workplaces, schools, and every other facet of public life was forced to shut their doors at the demand of the government. For a few days, it was kind of fun. We got to sleep in a bit, have an excuse to stay in watching Netflix instead of going out. And everybody who wanted an excuse not to go to the gym had the best one ever. They were literally forbidden from doing so by the government. But pretty quickly, forced solitude got old and people started getting antsy. After all, it's far from natural to be locked up in a cage all day with your only human interaction coming through a Zoom call. But beyond slowing down our economy and pace of life, the lockdowns did something else. They wreaked havoc on public health. The report stipulates that an additional 53 million cases of major depressive disorder and 76 million cases of anxiety disorders were caused by COVID. Now, as the world is finally opening up, we're beginning to get a picture of just how dangerous and in many cases deadly those lockdowns really were. While we were all affected, there was one group of Americans hurt more than any other though, young people. The report, unfortunately also says that younger people were the hardest hit by COVID when it comes to their mental health. While there were definitely early warning signs about the impact of lockdowns on children throughout the past two years, we now know just how devastated they really were. For example, one batch of data released from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, AKA the main federal authority that charted America's approach to lockdowns, revealed that the number of emergency room visits for suspected suicide attempts rose by 51% among teenage girls in 2020 alone, 51%. Remember, that was when lockdowns were most strict, but it actually got worse from there. At the end of March, 2022, the CDC quietly unveiled its first national study on the mental health status for high schoolers throughout COVID-19 lockdowns. And the results were absolutely devastating. For starters, 37% of high school students reported poor mental health and 44% reported a persistent feeling of sadness or hopelessness. One CDC official even admitted that, quote, these data echo a cry for help. But it wasn't just teenagers' mental health that the CDC looked at. They also looked at the impact of racism during the pandemic, because of course, according to the CDC, the mental health impacts for racial minorities and those struggling with their sexual orientation or gender identity was especially pronounced. They said that 64% of Asian students, 55% of black students, and 55% of multiracial students reported higher degrees of racism during the lockdowns. One major reason for the decline in mental health was that when kids were sent home from school, they often went back to dark environments. After all, many of their parents had lost their jobs and countless families were struggling to make ends meet as the government shut the economy down. As a result, home environments became less stable than usual and the impact on students was predictably enormous. 55% of high schoolers reported emotional abuse from their parents, including being sworn at, insulted, or otherwise put down. And 11% even experienced physical abuse, including hitting, beating, and kicking. Mikkel Fetterman died in April after being hospitalized for weeks with severe bruises, a skull fracture, and a brain bleed. My parents hit me constantly and sometimes lock me in the garage at night with the rats. Additional risk right now is kids not having access to the safety and security of schools, daycares, organized activities. And back in April 2020, the National Sexual Assault Hotline revealed a 22% increase in monthly calls from people under the age of 18. That meant half of all incoming calls were from minors. That's the first time in the entity's history that that was the case. Of those young people who contacted the hotline in March of 2020, for example, 67% identified the perpetrator as a family member and 79% said they were currently living under the same roof with that perpetrator. And because of the forced lockdowns, there was nowhere to go to get away from them. The story was similar around the world, from Asia to South America. India's child line service, for example, received more than 92,000 calls in one 11 day period during the lockdown. While in Bolivia, more than four dozen cases of violence against children were reported each day since lockdowns began. So what was the true underlying cause of this mess? Well, according to the CDC, they didn't have anything to do with it. It was all because of a lack of school connectedness. That sense of quote, being cared for, supported and belonging at school. Schools, which by the way, were shut down because of CDC guidance. By double digit margins, kids who felt connected to adults and peers at school 
We're less likely to report sadness or hopelessness, less likely to consider suicide or to actually attempt suicide. But the CDC noted that a mere 47% of youth said they felt close to people at school during COVID. After all, it's hard to feel connected at school when the government won't allow you to go to school. We can also now ask the question of not just what, but who was the true underlying cause of this mess. And as it turns out, the answer is oftentimes the CDC itself. They started out in March 2020, recommending that schools work with local health officials to decide COVID risk, even suggesting that, quote, extended school dismissals may be in the cards when high rates of community spread were observed. We as a family need to be preparing for significant disruption of our lives. And that's definitely understandable. Early in the pandemic, especially, the world was still trying to figure out just how dangerous COVID actually was. But within just a month or two of COVID arriving in the United States, it was abundantly clear that the disease primarily impacts older adults and those with underlying health issues. By June of 2020, for example, we knew that the COVID death rate for kids in New York City, which at that point was the epicenter of the disease in America, was zero per 100,000. Recognizing this reality, a few Western nations went the opposite direction of the CDC. They kept their schools open without a hitch. Sweden, for example, continued in-person instruction as much as possible, complemented by distance learning technology for when teachers had to miss class due to COVID exposure. And through the entire pandemic, how'd they do? They reported a mere 23 COVID deaths for children among nearly half a million cases. That's a 0.0046% rate of death for COVID among kids in Sweden. So did the CDC adjust their policies based on those observations? Of course not. In fact, more often than not, it seems they made their decisions not based on the observations that were going on and the new data we were receiving, but based on political expediency and not the science. Emails between the nation's second largest teachers union, the American Federation of Teachers and the CDC, showed that the union lobbied to keep schools shuttered and quote, even suggested language for the federal agency's school reopening guidance that was released in 2021. The AFT spent $20 million to elect Democrats in the 2020 election cycle, and their investment clearly paid dividends through their bought and paid for allies in the Biden administration. When confronted by the media on this fact, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki claimed that, quote, it's actually long-standing best practice for the CDC to engage with organizations and groups that are going to be impacted by guidance and recommendations issued by the agency. And more recently, a report from Republicans on the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Crisis found how the Biden administration CDC had a, quote, cozy relationship with AFT on COVID guidelines. In one instance recorded in the report, AFT Senior Director of Health Issues, Kelly Trotner, emailed CDC Director Rochelle Walensky, requesting a line be added to upcoming guidance that was not yet released to the public. Did you get that? She's asking for lines to be inserted into government guidance that was going to impact everyone's kids. Walensky forwarded the line to CDC Center for Preparedness and Response Director, Dr. Henry Walk, and it was included in the guidance the next day. Wouldn't you know it, she understood the science. The teachers union understood the science more than the CDC. Did the CDC even acknowledge the possibility that their policies might have worsened mental health outcomes among American children? Of course not. In fact, they even had the nerve to essentially say that the fault lied with, quote, schools, families, and communities who needed to step up and protect children from the fallout of the very decisions that the CDC made. Quote, what will it take for our schools and communities to help youth withstand the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond, asked one CDC administrator. Well, it seems that maybe the best course of action would be not trusting the CDC to decide what's best for our children. Maybe that role should have stayed with schools, families, and communities in the first place. I'm Cabot Phillips with The Daily Wire. Thanks for watching.